So this week, I had a deep heart-to-heart conversation with one of my buddies here. And that led me to releasing this video. What, what was that on YouTube? It's uh, a, a Christian Christian predicts Game of Thrones season eight. Um, for a long time, I kept quiet about Game of Thrones. And I mean, you know, there there were preachers saying, you know, this has bad content and there are a lot of Christians that shouldn't watch this. And I didn't want to talk about it because I did not want to provoke Christians who've, I mean, they've never seen a, a naked person's back before. They've, they've barely ever seen bare feet. And if they see a, fi- a foot without shoes or socks, it may make them want to go have sex with everything in sight. There are Christians who grow up so sheltered like this that that one small suggestion of anything will cause them to lapse into some destructive behavior pattern. And I did not want to provoke that. But it's kind of gone a little bit too far. Um, now we've got, I mean, people, there's this theory that if you look at the percentage of Muslims in a country, that once it gets to be, you know, so high... And I, I, I'm kind of thinking it's not exclusive to Muslims. If it's true, it, it's not just Muslims. It's any religion that's, or any established religion. You know, one that requires said real estate in order to operate. I mean, Christianity is a kingdom that lives in your hearts, folks. You don't need to have real estate in order for Christianity to function. You can use it, but you don't need it. It's not necessary. You know, Christians met in their homes. Jesus had no home. So there you go. But there's this theory that, that, that as you get more Muslims in a country, that they start beating up other religions and then they start beating up each other. But Christians do the same thing. It's not enough to say, um, you know, the content in Game of Thrones is bad and that's not what we should be watching, folks. We should be focused on the Bible. We should be focused on less entertainment and we need to have more good ideas going into our head. And why not us Christians? Why not make more interesting stuff? So um, instead of that, we've got, if you watch that, you're not even a Christian. And that's the level that it's getting to. And so I finally said, okay. And I, I asked one of my friends here what he thought about it. And he says, Jesse, I'm right in line with that. I called a friend and I said, uh, what's really wrong with the Game of Thrones? I mean, it's one world dictatorship stuff. And it's, it's a lot of um, I don't know. I'll believe it at that. I could say more. And he says, but Jesse, the critics don't even talk about the problem of the one world government dictator antichrist stuff in Game of Thrones. They just say that because there's nudity in three out of five episodes that therefore the whole thing is porn. And that's not, and I'm like, okay. So I thought about this and I went through this. So I released the video. I'm not advertising it on YouTube because I'm not going to try to promote that. But what, what you've essentially got is a story that's so well written. And, and of course, because Christians aren't writing the good stories, it's the non-Christians writing it who are putting nudity into it. And that was the, the nudity in Game of Thrones is the church's fault. The church should have been doing a good job at stuff so that they controlled Hollywood and they decided, no, George Martin, there won't be nudity in this one. That's what it should have been. But instead of taking responsibility for not doing a good job with stuff and whining and make and not taking responsibility for making bad movies all the time, the church, you got Christians cannibalizing each other. Like Sarah Palin says, the Republican Party is the party of cannibals. Well, so are the people who vote in it. And that's largely made up of Christians. So here we've got this, 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 this TV book series thing. And it's ingeniously written. And... One of the critics, one of the, one of the, one, one idea that I haven't heard out there goes back to the very first two scenes. There's this wall that separates the evil to the north from the normal humans to the south. And, and there's humans to the north that are trapped up there. And then there's the wicked blue eyed king to the north. And in the very beginning, one of the watchmen on the wall one of the watchmen 
encounters one of the blue-eyed servants from this blue-eyed king. And I'm, I'm really toning down my vocabulary because I don't want to advertise stuff. But this blue-eyed servant from the evil blue-eyed king to the north throws something at this watchman. And the watchman is scared. He's so scared, he deserts his post. He runs south of the wall where the ruling family south of the wall catches him. And the son in this family, one of them, Bran, is there and watches it all. And this same thing that the blue-eyed servant of the blue-eyed king threw at the watchman who deserted his post, that same thing, the, the, the watchman throws the same thing at this family. And when he throws that thing and that thing lands on the ground, Bran sees it and asks his father, is this real? Is this for real? And the theories, go, I mean, it's like if this blue-eyed king was the monster everyone makes him out to be, why didn't he just kill the watchman? Why did he try to send this message down to this family? Why is he trying to reach young Bran? And ultimately, the season finale, after eight books, eight seasons, it's going to answer that question. And a lot of people aren't even looking to that scene. And there's other questions. Why is there a wolf with five pups plus one albino that manages to impale itself from out of the land right on the road when Bran's on his way home from receiving this thing from the Blue-Eyed King? Why does this mother with, with five pups plus one albino manage to get herself killed on the road for Bran going home? And this family has five children plus one cousin living with them. Why, why, what's all happening in the very, very beginning? And it's all going to go back and answer that question. Now, some people think that Bran, young Bran, is the blue-eyed king to the north. But that's the kind of stuff that's developing. That's the kind of thick, ingenious plot that this guy wrote that people are asking questions about it and people are talking about it. They used to talk about Lord of the Rings like this. I was a substitute teacher and a girl came up to me after a class and she had been studying elvish and dwarfish. And, and I think it's dwarfish, not dwarfish. I'm sorry, Mr. Tolkien, if, um, if we're getting it wrong. I know he argued with the editors over dwarfish or dwarfish and elfish or elvish. Um, people used to talk about the Christian writings, but where are they? Where are the good Christian writings? Where are the good stories from the Christians who have ideas from Bible and histories of angels? Well, I'm, I'm just finishing it up. Memoirs of Ophanine. I'm finishing it up. I've gone back. I've done my own research. I've looked at the Bible stories. I've looked at Enoch. And I'm trying to contribute to this. I'm trying to write better. I'm trying to come up with better stuff. Because I'm, I'm just disappointed at churchianity cannibalizing each other, blaming each other, when non-Christians do things that non-Christians do, and they do a good job. They really do a good job. And Christians should want to look at anything that's a good job to understand it so they can do a good job. Now, if you're a Christian, the big issue is not what bad things you watch as much as what good things you don't do. Are you a Christian doing good things? Are you reading the Bible a lot? That's the bigger issue. That's the bigger issue. We need to make sure Christians have good things going into their heads. And when we try to tell people without a pastor, you don't have good things going into your heads, well, they stumble and fall. No, you've got a Bible and you need to be reading it every day. And that's the bigger issue. And I'm finally speaking out about it. And now I'm out of time and need to get to the point. The best method for negotiation is to know your minimal self. There are many tactics and theories taught by many people. There's the I don't need you, I want you tactic, also a truth. Then the you owe me and that's your problem tactics, plus the famous over aim to get what little you want tactic. But the best method is to know your minimal from the beginning. Declare it from the outset and stick to it. If you can compromise a point after 20 hours of talk, you never really wanted it in the first place. You should know that. And that's the point. I'm Jesse Steele. JesseSteele.com.